because assignment discovery is about to dig into the collection of elements known as the alkaline earth metals. First, we'll burrow into a brief overview of these earthy elements in Exploring Alkaline Earth Metals. Then, we'll see how one element helps build up the 206 bones in the human body in calcium building bones. Next, we'll dig up the past to discover the deadly after effects of the Chernobyl nuclear accident in strontium, fatal fallout. Then we'll trace the discovery of another element and see how its radiation was used to combat cancer in radium, Curie's Cure. And finally, we'll examine the complex chemical chain reaction that takes place inside the body's bones. Elements that can kill, elements that can cure, and elements that keep our body strong. Coming up next. As you watch the first half of this program, keep these questions in mind. What properties do the alkaline earth metals share? Why does the human body treat strontium and calcium the same way? The ancient Greeks believed that everything in the world was made up of just four elements, air, fire, water, and earth. The Greeks called the inert substances around them Earths, and while modern scientists have since discovered over a hundred elements, we call some of them alkaline earth metals because of these ancient Greek thinkers. What do you know about the alkaline earth metals? Magnesium oxide, it's a common reaction because magnesium has two electrons in the outer energy level and oxygen has six, so when they combine, they com form the complete octet of E. The alkaline earth metals are group two in the periodic table. The alkaline earth metals react fairly well, but not quite as well as the alkali metals. Calcium is very good for your bones. The alkaline earth metals are generally softer than most other metals, and they react readily with water, particularly when heated. Each has two valence electrons in its outermost electron shell. They are powerful reducing agents that readily give up electrons to other substances. The element beryllium can absorb large amounts of heat, which makes it useful for spacecraft and aircraft construction. Magnesium is a light metal. It is combined with other metals to make racing bicycles, airplanes, missiles, and other products that need to be lightweight and strong. Calcium is an essential element for countless living organisms. It forms the foundation for everything from shells to teeth and bones. Strontium goes into colorful flares and fireworks and phosphorescent paints. A radioactive version of this element is one of the most deadly byproducts of nuclear fallout. Barium is a heavy silver metal that is used in spark plugs, vacuum tubes, and fluorescent lamps. And radium is an intensely radioactive element that doctors once often use to destroy cancer cells. In their pure forms, the alkaline earth metals are shiny silvery gray metals. They have relatively high melting and boiling points and they are good conductors of heat and electricity. These metals have a gray-white luster when they are freshly cut, but they tarnish quickly when exposed to air. The heavier members of the group tarnish especially quickly. Beryllium, the lightest of the alkaline earth metals, is hard enough to scratch glass. But barium, the heaviest, is only slightly harder than lead. 
The alkaline earth metals react readily with water, especially when they are heated. They combine easily with other elements and as a result are never found in their pure, uncombined forms in nature. Although they are harder, stronger and denser than the alkali metals, they are nearly as chemically reactive. The alkaline earth metals are so reactive because they are very electropositive. This means that like the alkali metals, they easily lose electrons to other elements. Let's take a closer look at the periodic table. On the periodic table, the elements are listed in order of their atomic number. The atomic number represents the number of protons in an element's nucleus. In its normal or ground state, this nucleus is surrounded by an equal number of electrons. And as the atomic number increases, generally so does the size and mass of the atoms. As you read the periodic table from top to bottom, each horizontal line is called a period. Each period represents the number of electron shells the element's atoms normally have. For example, there are four electron shells in an atom of calcium, so it lies in period four. Meanwhile, an atom of barium in period six has six electron shells. As you read across the table from left to right, the vertical lines of elements are called groups. Elements in a group have the same number of electrons in their outermost electron shells. These outermost electrons are called valence electrons and they dictate how elements interact. Elements in the same group generally interact with other elements in similar ways. None of the elements greater than atomic number 83 are completely stable. All of these elements, including radium, are radioactive. All alkaline earth metals reside in group 2 because they each have two electrons in their outermost electron shell. Because atoms need eight electrons in their valence shell to be stable, the two valence electrons in the alkaline earth metals makes them unstable. Nearly as unstable as the alkali metals, which only have one valence electron. As a result, the alkaline earth metals easily lose their two electrons during chemical reactions. And as you move from beryllium to radium, the atom's hold on their valence electron becomes weaker, making each alkaline earth metal more reactive than the one before it. Did you know two alkaline earth metals are the main cause of hard water? When underground water passes through limestone or other carbonate rocks, it partially dissolves the rock and draws calcium and magnesium into the water. These and other dissolved elements make the water hard. While hard water is not dangerous, it generally tastes less sweet than soft water and leaves behind white deposits of mineral called lime scale. Calcium is an important part of our diets. It helps build and repair the bones in our bodies. Growing up without enough calcium can affect the development of human bones, teeth, and overall health. What things can hurt the development of your body? Eating junk food. Eating bad foods and not exercising is bad for your health. I think we don't sleep enough. Smoking. Drinking hurts your brain cells. Partying hard can sometimes adversely affect your health. Element number 20 on the periodic table is calcium. The atomic symbol for calcium is Ca. Calcium is a soft silvery white metal that tarnishes quickly when exposed to air. Calcium never occurs freely in nature because it is highly reactive and easily forms compounds with oxygen and water. Calcium gets its name from the Latin word calx, which means lime, because limestone is one of the sources of the element. Calcium is classified as an alkaline earth metal and lies in the periodic table's fourth row, period four. Each atom of calcium consists of a cloud of electrons surrounding a compact nucleus that contains almost all of the atom's mass. In the most common form of calcium, its nucleus has 20 positively charged protons plus 20 uncharged neutrons. Calcium has 20 negatively charged electrons to balance its 20 protons. 
These electrons are found in four orbital shells surrounding the nucleus, which can be visualized as being built up from the nearest preceding noble gas, argon. Argon has 18 electrons distributed among three orbital shells. Calcium has two more electrons than argon. The two electrons are found in the sphere-shaped 4s orbital shell. These two valence electrons make calcium very chemically active and it forms compounds with many other elements. Calcium is a silvery white hard metal which is difficult to cut. When exposed to air, it readily forms a thin white layer of oxide called lime, so the metal remains silvery for only a few minutes. Once several pieces have been cut, they are dropped into a bowl of water. The calcium metal reacts slowly with the water, forming milky white calcium hydroxide and bubbles of hydrogen gas. After 10 minutes, the water in the bowl becomes cloudy and highly alkaline with dissolved lime. Due to its high reactivity, metallic calcium has very few uses. Its compounds, on the other hand, have many uses. Calcium carbonate is used to make white paint, cleansing powder, toothpaste, and stomach antacids. And other compounds are used to make dry wall, plaster, and natural fertilizers. The human skeleton is incredibly strong, yet remarkably light. The 206 bones that make up our skeleton support our bodies, allow us to move around the world, and protect the vital organs inside us. And every one of our bones depends on the element calcium. We use calcium to help regulate our heartbeats and clot our blood. But 90% of the calcium in our bodies is in our bones. Our bodies use calcium, mostly in the form of phosphate and carbonate salts, to form and maintain our bones and teeth. Calcium is especially important when you are young because it helps bones grow stronger, bigger, and healthier. Bones make up only 18% of our total body weight, but they have to deal with all the impacts, strains, and stresses we put our bodies through every day. Our bones are a hard mix of calcium and other minerals on the outside, but they are spongy on the inside. And the ends of our bones have a honeycomb structure of arches and struts. These formations direct the force of impacts into the stronger middle section of the bone. Being thick and hard in some places and spongy and hollow in others helps make our bones very strong, but still light. Bones are living things. They are made up of living cells embedded in the calcium carbonate matrix that makes up the hard part of our bones. These cells are constantly repairing and replacing the calcium and other minerals in bone. This becomes especially important after an injury. When a bone breaks, the body immediately sends in the repair team. Cells called osteoblasts begin their repair work by excreting a layer of liquid bone. Over time, calcium and other minerals are drawn to the damaged area, strengthening, hardening, and eventually forming a new bone. The cells are constantly on the lookout for bones that have weakened from daily activity. Here, bone-destroying cells called osteoclasts break down weakened bones so they can be built up again. Within 10 years, these cells break down and replace every bone in your body, which is a very good thing especially for people who enjoy an active lifestyle and the knocks that come with it. Did you know mammals aren't the only ones who rely on calcium? Many corals, algae, planktons, and other invertebrates living in the ocean depend on calcium to build their skeletons or shells. The accident at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant released tons of radioactive materials into the air. These deadly elements, which included strontium-90, killed thousands of people, irradiated the nearby countryside, and forced thousands of people in Eastern Europe to abandon their homes. What event could make you leave your homeland? My parents once said, like, if people ever had to be, like, drafted into the army again, then we would move. Really sudden change in government, like, 
some one of our mayor rights got taken away. If my dad's job decided to move him overseas. Well, if there was another depression maybe, like there was in the 1920s, or maybe if there was a plague of some sort, a lot of disease. Irish potato famine, that caused a lot of uh, immigration uh, to the United States of America. Element number 38 on the periodic table is strontium. The atomic symbol for strontium is SR. Strontium is a soft silver yellow metal that can be found in three different crystalline forms. Strontium is named for Strontian, Scotland, a town near the mines where the first strontium bearing minerals were found. Strontium is an alkaline earth metal and lies in the periodic table's fifth row, period five. Each atom of strontium consists of a cloud of electrons surrounding a compact nucleus that contains almost all of the atom's mass. In the most common form of strontium, its nucleus has 38 positively charged protons plus 50 uncharged neutrons. Strontium has 38 negatively charged electrons to balance its 38 protons. These electrons are found in five orbital shells surrounding the nucleus, which can be visualized as being built up from the nearest preceding noble gas, krypton. Krypton has 36 electrons distributed among four orbital shells. The two additional electrons in strontium are found in the sphere-shaped 5S orbital shell. These two outermost valence electrons determine how strontium reacts with other elements. The silvery white metal strontium reacts easily with air, so this sample is protected by a thin layer of paraffin wax and kerosene. When the protective layer is burned off, the flame ignites the metal, which burns in air with an intense crimson light. When the metal burns, it produces a mixture of white strontium oxide and strontium nitride. Volatile strontium salts, such as these, are often used in fireworks and signal flares because they produce a brilliant crimson color. Most strontium is used to produce glass for television picture tubes. The element is sometimes combined with iron to make magnets and is also used in making pyrotechnics and phosphorescent paints. In the spring of 1986, the worst nuclear reactor disaster in history occurred at the Chernobyl nuclear power station in northern Ukraine. To run a test, engineers had deliberately disabled the emergency backup systems in one of the reactors. But instead of simply testing the reactor, they accidentally started an unstoppable nuclear chain reaction in the core of reactor number four. On April 26th, the reactor exploded, ripping the top off the reactor containment building and blowing radioactive material high into the atmosphere. As the reactor core burned, fires spread to the nearby buildings, and as they burned, the core released more and more radioactive materials. But as the danger of the explosion became more apparent, they called for the evacuation of Chernobyl, Prepryat, and other nearby towns. The fires at the Chernobyl plant raged for more than a week, and the burning nuclear core was brought under control only after a cement mixture was dropped onto it from the air. The explosion and the fires released eight tons of nuclear fallout into the atmosphere. Nuclear fallout is made of radioactive particles that are scattered through the Earth's atmosphere by winds and air currents. The Chernobyl release created a huge cloud of fallout that caused extensive harm across Eastern and Northern Europe. The serious danger of nuclear fallout is that it contains radioactive isotopes of the elements strontium, cesium, carbon, and iodine. In high doses, these isotopes can cause severe health problems or even death. One of these isotopes, strontium-90, remains radioactive for decades. And since strontium and calcium are both chemically similar alkaline earth metals, the tissues of animals and plants absorb strontium as if it were calcium. When humans consume contaminated foods and liquids, the strontium-90 accumulates in their systems and can cause genetic damage or lead to leukemia, bone cancer, and other diseases. Strontium is particularly dangerous for children because it is easily deposited in their growing bones. Ukrainian officials have estimated that at least 8,000 people died as a result of the Chernobyl accident 
and the cleanup of the radioactive materials it released. Millions of Europeans live on radiation-contaminated land, and countless more will likely suffer harmful long-term effects from the Chernobyl release of strontium and other radioactive elements. Did you know radioactive elements can be deadly to humans, but they are useful if properly harnessed? Engineers have developed generators that use the heat given off by decaying radioactive materials, such as strontium-90, to generate electric power for satellites and space probes. These thermoelectric generators are particularly useful for space probes that travel far from the sun, where solar panels no longer work. The discovery of radioactivity in the late 1890s led to the invention of nuclear medicine. The fact that radioactive elements such as radium could be used to kill cancer cells in the human body gave doctors a powerful new tool. What are some things that can cause cancer? Cancer can be caused by smoking. Smoking. Cigarettes can cause cancer. Leading an unhealthy lifestyle. Certain environmental conditions, I guess, like uh, pollution, things like that. Staying out in the sun too long. If you work with radiation, you can get cancer. It is genetic, like it, it is passed down through families. My friend lost both of his parents to uh, cancer, which I think would suggest that the area that he lived in uh, had environmental factors that were conducive to cancer. Element number 88 on the periodic table is radium. The atomic symbol for radium is Ra. Seen here in the glowing dials of this watch face, radium is a brilliant white metal that blackens when exposed to air. Radium glows in the dark and is extremely radioactive, more than a million times more radioactive than uranium. Radium gets its name from the Latin word for ray, radius, because of the radioactive rays it emits. Radium is classified as an alkaline earth metal. It lies in the periodic table seventh row, period seven. Each atom of radium consists of a cloud of electrons surrounding a compact nucleus that contains almost all of the atom's mass. In the most common form of radium, its nucleus has 88 positively charged protons plus 138 uncharged neutrons. Radium has 88 negatively charged electrons to balance its 88 protons. These electrons are found in seven orbital shells surrounding the nucleus, which can be visualized as being built up from the nearest preceding noble gas, radon. Radon has 86 electrons distributed among six orbital shells. Radium has two more electrons than radon. Both of these electrons are found in the sphere-shaped 7s orbital shell. It is these two valence electrons that determine how radium reacts with other chemicals. Radium is represented here by the display of nuclear fireworks inside an instrument called a spintheroscope. A small piece of radium is sealed within the device and as the radium atoms undergo natural radioactive decay, they release alpha particles. These alpha particles travel at over 20,000 miles per hour and, when they strike a zinc sulfide screen inside the device, photons of visible light are released in a process called scintillation. This produces the thousands of tiny flashes of greenish light that are visible through the device's magnifying lens. Each flash of light indicates a single atom of radium decaying. Radium is highly radioactive, so its use is limited. In the past, small amounts of radium were used to make glow-in-the-dark paint for watches, aircraft dials, and other instrument displays. But less dangerous alternates have largely replaced those early uses. Today, the element is primarily used in the treatment of cancer. The gamma rays it produces kill cancer cells. And radium is used to produce radon gas that is also used to combat some cancers. One of the most significant medical advancements of the 20th century was the invention of nuclear medicine. 
Nuclear medicine allows doctors to use small amounts of radioactive elements to get an inside view of a patient's body without surgery. When doctors find tumors, radioactive materials may also be placed directly into a patient's body, where the radioactivity helps fight the growth of cancer cells. The roots of nuclear medicine began in France in 1896 when Professor Henri Becquerel discovered that uranium was radioactive. Becquerel's discovery of radiation soon prompted other scientists to search for radioactive elements. Two scientists, the Polish-born Marie and Pierre Curie, made discoveries that would change the face of medicine. Using equipment designed by Pierre, Marie Curie measured and analyzed thousands of mineral samples. In early 1898, she discovered a second radioactive element, thorium. By the end of that year, the Curies had discovered two more radioactive elements, polonium and radium. Thorium and uranium had about the same radioactive strength, but polonium's was 10,000 times greater and radium strength was more than a million times that of uranium's. The discovery of such a highly radioactive element rocked the scientific world. Their work was extremely important. The discovery of radium opened up a whole new era. It's been described as the nuclear age. Pierre and Marie were the start of modern physics. Doctors soon discovered that exposure to strong radioactivity, like that given off by radium, could kill cancer cells. An early medical technique involved inserting radium needles directly into tumors. Radiation treatments helped millions of cancer patients throughout the world battle their disease. Although iridium, iodine, and cesium have replaced radium in radiation treatment, Nuclear medicine remains an effective method for detecting and treating cancer. Radiation therapy is a localized treatment of cancer involving external beam radiation and insertion of radioactive materials into the tumor. Radiation therapy was actually in use within a year of the discovery of radiation. Since then, it had become a highly sophisticated treatment of cancer. Of all cancers, radiation is the second most used after surgery. At the time of the Curie's discovery, scientists were unaware of the harmful effects of prolonged exposure to radioactivity. While radioactive elements can kill cancer cells, extended exposure to them can also cause cancer, anemia, and other disorders. Marie Curie's work with radium produced painful scars on her hands. And worse, her repeated contact with radioactive elements eventually brought her life to an end. She died of leukemia before reaching the age of 70. But her pioneering work made her the first person to win two Nobel Prizes, laid the groundwork for countless medical advances, and prolonged the lives of millions of people. You've been given all the information. Now it's your turn to discuss the questions. Take a moment to talk about the following. What properties do the alkaline earth metals share? Why does the human body treat strontium and calcium the same way? If you'd like to learn more about what you've just seen, go online or check out these books at your local library. As you watch the second half of this program, keep these questions in mind. What chemicals in the human body relieve pain after an injury? How does the body repair broken bones? The human skeleton relies on a variety of elements to perform the many important functions it does. One of the most important jobs our skeleton does is to keep our internal organs in place and protect the brain, heart, lungs, and other vital organs from harm. What are the organs in your body and what do they do? The brain controls your brain waves and your nerves and what you feel or think. Your heart, obviously, which beats life and blood around your body. This is the liver, like, what is that? To? I don't remember. The stomach whose job is to uh, digest food, make sure you break it down, then your body can get the nutrients from it. 
The liver? I don't know what that does. You have a liver which uh, detoxifies poisons. I think the pancreas is the weirdest organ, specifically because I'm not quite sure what it does. Every day, Lisa Mason puts her body under tremendous strain. If it were a machine, it would break down in months. But the human body has an amazing capacity for self-maintenance and repair. In the next few days, Lisa will test this ability to the limit. To withstand the pressure that Lisa puts on it, her body needs to be incredibly strong. The strength lies in her bones. Bones resist compression forces twice as well as granite, yet they are just one-fifth the weight of steel. Deep inside, bone isn't solid. It's made of interconnecting arches like a honeycomb housing nerves and blood vessels. These arches are built of a composite material, a mixture of tough elements such as the alkaline earth metal calcium, the non-metal phosphorus, and a flexible protein called collagen. Only this century did human engineers discover what nature has always known, that composites of elements can be stronger than the individual elements that go into them. Gravity. Oh, never mind, I'll mend it later. Come on. Lisa's bones aren't just composite, they're adaptable. Their interior honeycomb structure continually adapts to the way she uses them. Like every human, Lisa has a walk that is unique to her. And her leg bones have evolved a unique structure to match. Their tiny inner arches have grown into a pattern designed to disperse the impact of her walk and to protect her delicate joints. If the way she walks were to change, through injury for example, the arches inside her bones would quickly realign themselves. <laughs> Beneath Lisa's skin, her bones are teeming with life. Full of blood vessels and nerves, they're as alive as her heart or her brain. Inhabiting their interior landscape are millions of microscopic life forms whose job it is to keep Lisa's skeleton in a state of eternal youth. These cells are part of a complex maintenance network which uses chemicals such as calcium, hydrogen, carbon and oxygen to keep her bones healthy. First, cells called osteoclasts squirt a hydrochloric acid, which is strong enough to burn through sheet metal. Hydrogen ions in the acid react with the main mineral in bone, calcium hydroxyapatite, and break it down. This reaction releases calcium into the bloodstream. As the acid dissolves the tough coating of calcium, other minerals, and the strands of collagen beneath, a crew of bone-building cells called osteoblasts follows in its wake. These cells lay down new collagen and coat it with a fresh coat of calcium salts. The collagen fibers and calcium salts combine to form a structure with the strength of reinforced concrete. 
throughout Lisa's skeleton, the bone destroyers and bone builders work ceaselessly to prevent her bones from ever getting so old that they crack and crumble. Around 10% of her bone is replaced every year. Over time, the process will slow down, but even if Lisa lives to be 95, none of her bones will be more than 20 years old. London. What's your name? Lisa. That's not the sort of bike you want round here. I bet you can't ride over our ramp on it. Come on then! Sometimes the human body is called upon to do more than gradual renewal and repair. Sometimes, it has to deal with a major catastrophe. As she rides, Lisa's brain sends chemical signals to her individual muscles to tense and relax, making subtle adjustments to keep her body balanced. It's a system of breathtaking complexity, involving practically every bone and muscle in her body. Unfortunately, it's not infallible. As Lisa hits the ground, the bones in her arm are subjected to a sudden force 25 times her body weight. Despite bone's incredible strength, under this much pressure, their narrow part is designed to break. Lisa's radius bone snaps to prevent damage to the rest of her body. Lisa! Lisa! I'm okay. You better get her mom. Yeah, right now. Inside Lisa's bone, there is carnage. Its intricate arches have been smashed to pieces. Hundreds of tiny blood vessels have been severed. Battered pain nerves send frantic signals up her spinal cord to her brain. Her brain responds by releasing natural painkillers called endorphins. Endorphins are amino acids and are made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sometimes sulfur. Lisa's endorphins mute the pain signals to almost nothing. The brain involves endorphins to keep pain at bay for a few vital minutes in case she needs to escape danger. In addition to her broken arm, Lisa has a badly bruised knee and a severe abrasion on her hand. But she can't feel any of them. For the moment, she's anesthetized. Ten minutes after the accident, Lisa's endorphins have worn off. The pain is distressing, but it's also essential. It's the body's way of alerting us to internal damage. As the pain grows, Lisa instinctively rubs her arm as close to the injury as she can bear. This rubbing releases another wave of pain-blocking chemicals but they're milder than endorphins, too mild to counter the frantic pain signals coming from her broken bone. Lisa has done severe damage to her body, but already it is showing signs of its remarkable ability to heal itself.
On her hand, the task is to stop blood from pouring from tiny severed vessels. Specialist blood cells, called platelets, change their shape as they come into contact with damaged flesh. They turn into tiny spheres, which lock together and plug the wound. At the same time, invisible proteins in her blood solidify into strands of a substance called fibrin. A net of fibrin is thrown across the wound, trapping the blood cells beneath. Now the fibrin net contracts, squeezing liquid out of the clot like water out of a sponge. And as the clot shrinks, it pulls the skin together, closing the wound. One quick blast of water and the body's careful repair is washed away. But once Lisa's wound is cleaned, it will start to heal again as swiftly as before. Lisa's surface wound has been treated, but no one knows the extent of the injury beneath her skin. Yet without waiting for the doctor, her damaged arm is summoning help from her own body. The battered tissues around the fracture send out chemical signals, called prostaglandins, which make her arm swell to double its normal size. The swelling is caused by blood vessels dilating in her arm. Fluid passes from the blood into the surrounding tissue, flooding the fracture site with oxygen and other nutrients. The chemicals which trigger swelling also cause the pain nerves in her arm to become more sensitive. The slightest pressure has them firing off pain signals to her brain. Her pain threshold is now so low, she can even feel the blood pulsing through her swollen vessels as a throbbing ache. But once again, pain has a purpose. It protects Lisa's arm by making sure she does nothing to aggravate the injury. It's an hour and a half after the accident before the doctor can take a look beneath Lisa's skin. Already things have begun to change. Just as on the surface of her hand, blood is clotting inside her fractured bone. But so many blood vessels have been severed that it will take another half an hour for the flow of blood into the brain to completely stop. The result will be a huge blood clot enveloping the entire fracture, a hematoma. I'm afraid you've broken your arm just across there. That must have been a spectacular fall. What bone have I broken? Look, there's two bones there. There's the small bone. There's the very little the doctors can do for Lisa. They can set her arm in plaster, but her self-healing processes must do the rest. In a few weeks, it'll be as right as rain. Once the hematoma around the fracture is fully formed, her body will transform this massive clot from blood to bone. I'm sorry, I can't find the knives and forks anywhere. Oh, wait till I see those girls again. It wasn't their fault, you know, Mum. Excuse me, Liz. Lisa's body is faced with a massive repair job. To mend the broken bone in her arm, she needs thousands of bone-building cells, and quickly.
Inhabiting the spaces deep inside her bones are specialist cells called stem cells, responsible for replacing dead and damaged tissue. Stem cells are factories making new cells. Usually they divide to create a new cell once every two days. Now to form an army of bone-building osteoblasts, they divide once every three minutes. And it doesn't sound as if they were being very friendly to me, Lisa. You just don't understand kids these days, do you, Dad? Uh. That bit goes there. Eight hours after the accident, and the bone builders are inside the hematoma. The calcium and other minerals they release encase the clotted blood cells in tough bone. Outside the clot, more osteoblasts are working. The transformation from blood into bone is underway. Lisa's body is doing what no machine can ever do. It is repairing itself. Repair work is going on all over Lisa's body. On her knee, blood from tiny vessels severed when she hit the ground has been trapped inside her skin. As the iron-based pigment, which makes blood red, is gradually broken down chemically, the bruise changes color from dark red or black to dark green, light green, yellow, and finally disappears. In the space of just five days, her body clears the blood away completely. Well, we're planning on putting in a new kitchen, but apart from that, everything's fine, really. Less than a week after the accident, the clot on Lisa's hand has dried to become an irresistibly itchy scab. Lisa, don't, don't pick. Thank you. Hi. No, it's fine. Well, maybe next week. New skin is growing fast around the scab. A millimeter beneath the surface, stem cells are dividing to create new skin cells. The new cells are pushed up to replace the damaged skin above. Lisa's scab begins to loosen and is easier to pull off. No, 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 it's fine. Maybe. I'll get it. No, no, it's fine. My mum said I should bring these for you. Wow, is it broken? The two broken ends of Lisa's bone are steadily bonding together. Her cast protects the injury, but it's designed not to restrict the movement of the bones completely. As she flexes her fingers, the two ends of the break shift gently in relation to each other. This movement generates tiny electric currents, which seem to invigorate the work of the bone builders. Movement is actually helping to fix Lisa's broken bone. What are you doing? Oh, my finger exercises. I've never lived in the countryside before. You like it? You can see the stars better at night. I like that. Until the bone builders have finished their work, Lisa's arm is still fragile. So her pain nerves have remained sensitive in an effort to protect her. but her body is mending at a remarkable rate. On her hand, new skin is laid down in such a hurry that there's no time to replicate the pattern of the original skin. In fact, because children heal more quickly than adults, they scar more easily too.
Neil Armstrong said, one small step from man, one giant leap from mankind. Just four weeks after her accident, Lisa's cast is ready to come off. Deep inside, the hematoma is almost pure bone. The bone builders are finishing their work, and in the process, something quite remarkable happens. They deliberately wall themselves in. Then they send out filaments like tiny antennae to broadcast from their prisons of bone. Why they do this isn't fully understood, but throughout Lisa's skeleton, thousands of walled-in bone builders are sending out signals. Somehow, they are part of the complex process by which her bones adapt to the stresses and strains which Lisa puts on them. Because she is still growing, Lisa's bone has healed twice as fast as an adult's would. As we get older, our bone's regenerative powers decline. But with time, they can always perform their own remarkable repair. Under her skin, the hematoma has been transformed into a solid ball of bone, twice as thick and strong as the original bone. But a stronger section of her bone could be a weakness. If Lisa were to fall on her arm again, her radius might not break in the way nature intended. She could do herself even more serious damage. So in Lisa's arm, the bone destroyers, the osteoclasts, stir into life. With jets of acid, they begin dissolving the thick over-repaired bone. They will continue to re-sculpt it until it is exactly the shape it would have been had it grown normally and never been broken. Although it's only taken a month to fix the bone, the bone destroyers will keep sculpting for another whole year. By next summer, the bone destroyers will also have carved tunnels through the inside of the bone, perfectly restoring its intricate arches. Filled with blood vessels and teeming with life again, it will look like any other bone in Lisa's body, as if the accident had never happened. You've been given all the information. Now it's your turn to discuss the questions. Take a moment to talk about the following. What chemicals in the human body relieve pain after an injury? How does the body repair broken bones? We hope you've enjoyed this assignment discovery analysis of the alkaline earth metals. If you'd like to learn more about what you've just seen, Go online or check out these books at your local library.